a PRI circuit is going to use one of the 24 channels on a T1 or one of those 32 channels on an E1 to send a signaling protocol. There's a layer 3 signaling protocol that ISDN uses called Q.931 and that's going to carry a ton of information. It's going to carry much more signaling information than just saying the phone is on hook or the phone is off hook. It's going to be able to carry information such as caller ID information, the number that was dialed. If a call does not go through, it can give us information as to why that call does not go through. It can flag that call as being a subscriber call, in other words, a local call, or a national or long distance call, or an international call. A lot of information can be communicated using that separate signaling protocol. But as I said, if we do that, we're using one of those DS zeros. What I've just described is something called a common channel signaling. We're using a channel to carry signaling information. There's another way to carry signaling information on a T1 or an E1, and that's to use CAS, Channel Associated Signaling. Channel associated signaling doesn't carry near as much information as the Q.931 protocol. It's going to give basic information like we're on hook or off hook, but it's not going to give near the information that we can have inside of an ISDN circuit. In fact, channel associated signaling uses four bits per channel to represent the signaling for that channel. The bits are called the A, B, C, and D bits and usually a channel doesn't even use all four bits. In some cases it might only use one bit to say if this particular circuit is on hook or off hook. There's not a lot of information going over a channel associated signaling circuit. So why would we use it if ISDN is so much better? Well on a T1 we said we had 24 channels to start with. If we make one of those a signaling channel that we're going to run Q931 over, that leaves us with only 23 channels that are going to be able to carry voice. We just gave up a channel that could carry voice. Maybe that's not an acceptable trade-off. That's the case for maybe going with a channel associated signaling on a T1. Why would we do it on an E1? I have no idea. Unless we're trying to be backwards compatible. Channel associated signaling on an E1 does not give us any benefit that I could see other than possibly backwards compatibility. In fact, if you ever come across the term E1R2, that's referring to channel associated signaling on an E1. And I'll talk about why we don't have the same advantage on an E1 of freeing up a channel like we do on a T1 in just a moment. But there's one other type of digital circuit represented on the screen and it's a BRI. Remember the PRI that was the primary rate interface? Well the BRI is another type of ISDN circuit. It's a basic rate interface and it's not built on a T1 or an E1. It's kind of its own special thing. It's only got a couple of bearer channels called B channels. They're 64k each. And then it's got a little tiny 16 kilobit per second signaling channel. It's called the D channel or the delta channel. And it's going to carry Q931, but it doesn't need as much bandwidth as a PRI does because it's only carrying signaling for a couple of channels. And BRI is still out there, but it seems to be dwindling in popularity just a bit with the advent of things like cable modems and DSL modems when it's so inexpensive to get much higher data rates. And to review, we've now talked about how we can represent the spoken voice using a series of bits. We said that we're going to do that over a digital circuit, but we haven't answered the question, how do we send, in the case of a T1, maybe 24 separate conversations on one circuit? The answer is TDM, time division multiplexing. To borrow a line from Whitney Houston, each channel has one moment in time. We're going to take turns, just like we learned in kindergarten. We're going to send a sample from channel 1, then we're going to send a sample from channel 2, then we're going to send a sample from channel 3, and on and on and on, until we send that final sample from channel 24, and then we start all over again. Everybody gets their own moment in time, and as a result, we get to send multiple conversations digitally over a single circuit. When we do the configuration of a T1 circuit, and we'll make that our focus rather than an E1, we don't want this video to get longer than it's already going to be, but focusing on a T1 circuit, let's think about how we can represent a binary 1 and a binary 0. We talked about this earlier, if we want to represent a binary 0, that might be represented by the absence of any voltage. And if we wanted to represent a binary 1, that would be represented with the presence of voltage. And I said that sometimes it might be positive, sometimes it might be negative. Here's what's going on with that. We can have a better electrical characteristic on a line if the average voltage is 0. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have an average of 0 volts. 
on that line. That can help prevent things like excessive capacitance or inductance. And the way we get an average of zero volts is when we send one binary one, it's a positive voltage. And when we send the next binary one, it's a negative voltage. And we alternate back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative. And this approach is called AMI, alternate mark inversion. But there's an issue with alternate mark inversion. And yes, there are some vendor proprietary workarounds. You can use AMI, but in its native raw form, AMI's got a big issue. AMI can have an issue when it tries to send a byte containing all zeros. In other words, eight zeros in a row. If we have the absence of voltage for this period of time, AMI can sometimes get confused about when it's seen the end of the eighth bit. After all, we're not varying. It's just silence for eight straight bits. AMI has a problem with that, or it can. The fix for AMI, and what we will typically use in the real world, is something called B8ZS, or Bipolar 8-0 Substitution. What we're going to do is represent these eight zeros. If we have a byte containing all zeros, we're going to represent these eight zeros by creating a couple of bipolar violations. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Here's what I mean. Notice on screen that I've shown that just before we started this byte containing all zeros, we had a positive voltage to represent a binary one. And that's followed by eight zeros. But notice, when we get to that fourth of those eight zeros, we send another positive voltage. Wait a minute, the last voltage was positive. We just created a bipolar violation. And then we create another bipolar violation. We send two consecutive negative voltages at the fifth and the seventh bit positions. And then we kind of even things out by sending a positive voltage at the eighth bit position. It looks like we've made a couple of errors in this transmission. But actually, if both ends of the circuit understand B8ZS, they're simply going to interpret that as, oh, that's telling me that this is a byte containing all zeros because I saw those two bipolar violations happen at very specific bit positions. That's one thing we need to configure. How are we going to represent binary zeros and ones on a digital circuit? AMI or B8ZS? And that's for a T1. An E1 can use something different than B8ZS called HDB3, but we won't get into that. And I've tried to come up with a metaphor to help you think about how this works, how we can have an average of zero volts on the wire by alternating between positive and negative voltages. Here's the best metaphor that I've got so far. If I take one of my hands and stick it in a bucket of ice cold freezing water, and I take my other hand and I stick it in a pan of boiling hot water, on average, I'm going to be comfortable. Okay, it doesn't work that way for humans, but that is the way it works electrically. Now that we understand how we're going to digitally represent these zeros and ones on the wire, let's think about what a T1 frame looks like. Many of you probably know that a T1 has a bandwidth of 1.544 megabits per second. That's a number that you just know when you're in the telecommunications industry. And I've known it for years and years. And I was sitting around one day, and who of us hasn't done this, had my calculator out, and I thought, well, I know that we've got 24 channels in a T1, and I know that each channel is 64K in size, so I'm just guessing if I were to multiply 24 by 64,000, I should get 1.544 million, right? Well, I tried it, and I didn't get that. What was going on? What I had not considered was this. I did not consider a framing bit to say when one T1 frame stops and another starts. You see, if we take all 24 channels that we're sending, and we multiply that by 8 because we're sending an 8-bit sample per channel, that gives us 192 bits. But on top of those 192 bits, we add a framing bit, which means that each T1 frame is 193 bits in size. If you take 193 and multiply that by 8,000 based on what Professor Nyquist taught us, that's going to give us the 1.544 megabits per second. But something that's really interesting is we never send a T1 frame solo. We always group a bunch of T1 frames together. And this is something else we need to configure correctly on our digital voice ports. We need to say if we're going to be using super framing or extended super framing. Super framing is when we take 12 of these 193-bit frames and we glue them end to end if you want to visualize it like that. I've never seen that used in the real world. I've been doing this for many years. I've never seen anybody in the real world use super framing. What I have seen a ton of is extended super framing. An extended super frame contains 24 
of these 193-bit frames all stuck together end to end. And this goes back to the question of, if we're doing channel-associated signaling, and we're going to be using those four bits, the A, B, C, and D bits, to say, for example, this channel is off-hook or this channel is on-hook, where do those bits come from? In a T1 circuit, it's called robbed bit signaling. Why do we call it robbed bit signaling? That's literally what we're doing. We're going into every sixth frame, frame number 6, 12, 18, 24, and we're going to rob the low order sampling bit from those frames. And those bits are going to be used for the A, B, C, and D signaling bits. Does that degrade the voice quality? Yes, technically it does. I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but technically it does, to be fair. But that's an acceptable trade-off for many people because by doing this on a T1, we get an extra channel. We get to use all 24 channels instead of giving up a channel just for signaling. This is an argument that does not hold up for the E1 world, however. In an E1 circuit, instead of having a super frame or an extended super frame, instead we have a multi-frame. A multi-frame consists of 16 E1 frames. Now, remember what we said? We said that an E1 had 32 channels. Here's the way this breaks down. The very first channel, as I've drawn for you on screen, is always, always, always used for framing and synchronization. It's not used for signaling. It's not used to carry voice, video, or data. It's used for framing and synchronization. That's the first channel. The 17th channel is always used for signaling. Doesn't matter if we're doing a channel-associated signaling, as we see here on screen, or if we're doing common channel signaling, like on an ISDN circuit. Channel 17 is always used for signaling. As a result, we don't get the benefit that we do with a T1. We don't get to free up another channel for a voice call by using channel-associated signaling. That's the reason I said, I see no value in doing this other than being backwards compatible. But let's break it down. How does this work? We said an E1 multiframe is going to contain 16 E1 frames. In channel 17 of the very first frame, there is a bit sequence that declares the beginning of this multiframe. And then, as I've drawn with the arrows on screen, in the 17th channel of the second frame, we've got how many bits? That's right, we've got 8 bits per channel. How many signaling bits do we need for channel? 4, A, B, C, and D. We're going to use 4 bits in channel 17, in frame 2. We're going to use 4 bits as the signaling bits for channel 2. We've got four bits left. We're going to use the other four bits as the signaling bits for channel 18. In the next frame, we're going to use four bits as signaling bits for channel 3, and four bits as the signaling bits for channel 19, the A, B, C, and D bits. And we do this over and over and over. We do this 15 times. Each of those 15 frames is representing signaling for two channels. 15 times 2 is 30. We're able to represent the signaling for 30 channels in a multi-frame which is exactly how many channels we can use for voice. Even though we start out with 32 channels, the first channel is for framing and synchronization, the 17th channel is for signaling, and it doesn't buy us anything to go with a channel-associated signaling. So why not use common channel signaling as my philosophy? We've now talked about a lot of digital theory. I want to make this practical. Let's go out and take a look at how to configure a T1 voice port for both CAS, Channel Associated Signaling Operation, and for ISDN, Common Channel Signaling Operation. And by the way, the graphics that I've used in this presentation, I've adapted these graphics from a book I wrote for Cisco Press. So if you found this discussion interesting and you'd like to read more about digital signaling theory and voice sampling, this content has largely come from my Voice Over IP First Step book. You might want to check that out at your local bookstore or maybe check it out online. But it's a Voice Over IP First Step from Cisco Press, a book I wrote just a few years back. Now let's go out to the live interface.